morning, everybody. Um, good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, I know it's getting later in semester. I'm starting to get tired. And there are exams and mid-semesters. But uh, we appreciate you coming all the more. Um, no pizza first this week. Um, we learned our lesson. We saw how many of you skipped away after the food. <laughs> we had something more exciting, though. Um, we have Liam. <laughs> Hi, Neil. Hi, Neil. Hi, Neil. Um, our, our, our favorite uh, student lecturer. <laughs> um, and he's going to talk about Rust. Um, really? I will let him introduce you. No. I'll let him introduce himself and give you the pitch. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Neil. Might have figured that out by now. And this is the Rust talk. So, a bit of backstory. I started learning Rust about two years ago, and not long after that, I thought, hey, you could just have a talk on Rust. And I tried pressuring my friend Justin into doing it, and he wasn't really keen. Next year, I tried pressuring my friend Tom into doing it, and they're both graduating onto Atlassian, so if you want something done right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, quick bit of introductions. Hi, I'm Neil, everyone's favorite student lecturer, apparently, though that might just be because I'm one of the only ones out there. Um, I've been doing Rust for two years now, and in my final year of software engineering, and last year I was on the committee for UQCS. Um, Agenic, that is the place that I work. They've just this past week or so signed up for a gold sponsorship with UQCS, so you're going to be hearing a lot more from us soon. We're always hiring, I have to shamelessly pitch my company at the start of the talk. <laughs> Please come work for us. They let me write in Rust, so they must be cool. <laughs> um, so, quick bit on all of you out there. Um, just a quick show of hands, who's done programming in Python 4, 1001? Hands up still for Java? C? Haskell? Or other functional programs. <laughs> 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 Alright, cool. I'll try to keep the pictures relative to swaying those demographics over the Rust. Um, <laughs> so next up, Rust. Rust is a systems programming language designed for efficiency, speed, and safety. <coughs> I think that's the pitch they use. It was fast, um, efficient, and safe. Pick three. Something like that. <laughs> Rust is cool. It was built, started maybe 10 years ago, but actually became a stable language four years ago. Was built inside of Mozilla, originally for rewriting some of the rendering in Firefox. It's now Stack Overflow's most loved language four years in a row and counting. <laughs> it's really cool. The reason I'm up here is because I think Rust is a great language. However, it's not an easy language to learn, and so this talk will not be me teaching you how to write Rust, and you're not, unless you already know how to, you're probably not going to leave here knowing how to write Rust. I've only got an hour, and if I explained all of Rust in an hour, I would be tired by the end of it, and no one would understand what I was saying. <laughs> um, so what I'm trying to do here is not teach you Rust, but show you enough reasons that Rust is cool that you want to go out and teach yourself Rust later. That's, that's the goal. See how I do at the end. So the plan, introductions, that was the last slide. Um, I've got, over the past couple days, I've been hacking together a, a small toy Rust project, which all of today's code demos are going to be from. Uh, so I'll show you around that. Then we're going to do a quick, brief Rust 101 on just some syntax things, so that when I show you code later, you have a rough idea what you're looking at. And then Rust, the good bits, where I list all of the good things about Rust to make you want to learn to write it. And then I'm going to finish up by just talking about places that use Rust in the real world, because contrary to popular belief, a couple companies are actually using Rust <laughs> out there and paying people to write in it. So um, here's one I prepared earlier. I built a small command line search engine. That sounds kind of daunting, and that was the point. I wanted it to seem kind of impressive. It's only 500 lines of code though. It's all open source. I'll send you links. At, well, yeah, here's the link. You can read it if you want. <laughs> um, it's a little search engine. It builds up an index, and then you give it a search phrase, and it prints out all the files that match that phrase. Um, 
The tricky bit is that it tries to be optimized for searching code, in particular C code. So um, it'll do a little bit of basic parsing before it starts indexing things and before it saves things, which means that if your, yes, yeah, I'll show you actually, that's probably easiest. So here's my terminal. Everyone let me know if that's too small. So this is the OpenBSD um, source tree. It is a decent amount of code. I'm just going to wait there. It is a lot of code. There we go. So it's about, what, 13, 14 million lines all up. Of that, 6 million lines are all C code. So there's a lot of code here. And having tried contributing to OpenBSD before, running a grep through all 16 million lines takes a while. So, search engine. Search a thing, brings up some files with that search code in it. Um, it's nice and smart, so it's doing some intelligent code parsing in there. That's the general gist of the tool. Um, the slow bit is building up indexes. So if you have a look, there's this little .looker file folder, which I made. That contains all of the search stuff. So if I try to search now, doesn't work. It takes a second or two. Um, let me scroll that up so you can all see. And then you can search again and it starts working. That's the gist of the tool. All right. So what I'm going to be doing later is showing you bits of that tool and how Rust was able to make me write it over a weekend rather than over several weeks, which is what probably would have taken me in any other language. Um, so yeah, that's where we're going with this. But first, just a brief crash course on Rust syntax. So this is a factorial function. <laughs> so, key things to note here, um, the return type of the function goes at the end with a little arrow. The function parameters, rather than being int x, it's x colon int, or in this case u32, which is short for unsigned 32-bit integer. And then fn for function. So that's basic stuff. There's an if statement. Um, we don't need braces around it. That's a cool thing, I guess, if you like micro efficiencies. <laughs> then we don't need to write return because in Rust, by default, the last expression just gets returned by the function. I'll touch on that soon. Next up, structs. So structs, if you're familiar with C, we have those as well. They're a little bit different from proper Java classes in that, well, at a, at a runtime level, they're stored as structs, but you can still put methods on them and call something dot method. So we've got the standard struct with fields. You can create a struct kind of like this. So field value, field value, type of the struct. And that's a variable. Um, we've also got weird structs. So um, it's called a tuple struct. It's like the equivalent, well, it's a tuple, so just a little tuple with one little integer in it. But to tell it apart from other tuples, we can give it a name. And so now, that would be different to that. 
And if you try to mess this up with another, similarly, another tuple with the exact same types but a different name, it'll stop you. So use cases for that is if you have a tuple struct for millimeters and a tuple struct for inches, and you take those as arguments rather than just numbers. Little things. And then there's unit structs. It doesn't actually store any information, but you can do some fun type hackery with it. I'm not going to explain the type hackery, but that's the syntax if you ever want to do the type hackery. Um, next up, and this is where things start getting cool, is enums <coughs> or enumerated types. So for the Haskell people out here, this is our sum type. Um, the idea is, if you think of a union in C, so for those who don't remember, that's one set bit of memory that could have different values stored inside of it. So if you have four bytes, those four bytes could be one integer, or those four bytes could be um, four separate characters in a row. Right? And the idea here is you can save memory by stuffing it all into the same four bytes, but then every time you want to look at the value, you need to say, is this four characters, is this an integer, and you can treat it differently depending on what value it has. So an enum, this here, it's one value, so, and it's all the same type, which is mystery, and the idea is what's inside it is kind of a mystery. It could be just one as a constant, or it could be type of mystery two with a seven inside of it, or it could be type of mystery three with foo being seven and bar being an at symbol. All right, so all three of these are the same type. If you have a function that takes a mystery, you could give it whatever. And then on the other hand, on the other side of the function, you need to get the values out by checking first what type of mystery it is, and then you can get the values out for that type. All right. I'll touch on why this is useful in just a sec, but there's just a lot of syntax to get through for. <laughs> so we have <laughs> constants like all your other functions, numbers, numbers that are a certain size. This is just saying is of type unsigned 128 bit, signed integer 32 bit. We've got strings, we've got characters, We've got arrays of bytes. So um, all strings in Rust, star and char and string, they're all Unicode, UTF-8. So that means you can put emojis in your code. Your code can read people who are typing emojis into a terminal without breaking. But it also means that there's a possibility that someone could enter a string of bytes, and that string of bytes isn't actually a string. So we differentiate between strings that are known to be valid Unicode and filled with emojis, and strings that are just a bunch of bytes next to each other with no known value. Um, so yeah, you chuck a B in front of your string literal, and it becomes a byte string with anything in it. Same, you can chuck a B in front of your character literal, and it will become an ASCII byte. Right. Um, so all of these evaluate to expressions. You could put in front of it that x equal, and you could assign that to a variable, you could pass that to a function, you could return that from a function. They're all expressions. Now, of course, we've also got operators. That's all standard, plus, minus, regular stuff. Um, next up, where things start getting a little bit different from what, what you're used to, um, if statements are no longer if statements and they're now if expressions. So you could chuck a semicolon there and say let x equal if thing three else four. Yep. Is it just let and var in rest? Um, let and let mute. So like that. So. <laughs> Um, by default, everything's constant. So, let and var is that JavaScript. 
Yeah, I thought I saw a bar earlier. Uh, yeah. Maybe. Um, let for us is constant JavaScript. Let let mute is let in JavaScript. Uh, yeah. Um, so everything is an expression is basically the takeaway here. If you yeah, if you have an if statement and two different values, rather than saying x equals three in here and x equals four in there, you can just move the x equals out to the front. Like this. So the if statement is now an expression. As well as that, you can just create a block, like braces, bit of code, more braces, and that will evaluate to an expression. As well as that, loops are expressions. That one took some getting used to and took some arguing in various forums before the <laughs> language team would allow it. But you can get a value out of a loop now. Um, there, are, there are mixed faces out there in the audience. I promise it's not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> so here I've got loop. This is not a full loop or a while loop, this is just an infinite loop, it'll keep running until you call break. But the thing is, rather than just calling break, you call break with the value that you're breaking out with, and then that becomes the value of the expression. 99% of the time, all of your horrified faces are accurate, you don't actually need this. But in the 1% of the time when you do need it, it's really useful to have, and it doesn't get in your way the other 99%. Yes? For that specific example, would it not compile because there's no break for each? There's no break. Well, there's only one break. Yeah, so there's only one break. Uh, but the thing is, because it's an infinite loop, oh, the ones that don't <laughs> break just keep going. Okay. Um, we have got for loops and while loops, but they are non-expressions because there's a possibility to reach the end of the loop without running a break. Um, and as well as that, statements. So in Rust, in most other imperative languages, so C, Java, Python, everything is a statement, and then a few things are expressions. So you've got if statements, for loops, ask, treat it as statements. Here, everything is an expression unless you tell it otherwise. So everything will evaluate to something. Um, the way you create a statement is you take two expressions and you put a semicolon in the middle. And that says, evaluate this expression, throw it away, evaluate the next expression. And it's a weird way of thinking about code, but your block of code with six lines and each has got a semicolon at the end is a big chain of evaluate this, throw it away, evaluate this, throw it away, evaluate this, and then you reach the last one, you evaluate it, and that's the answer. Right. So it's a bit of a weird model of evaluating things, but the code all looks the same, and what it means is that at the end, rather than having to write return on the last line of your function, it's just whatever the last expression in your function evaluates to is the output of the function. So here I've got an if expression, which either evaluates to one or the other factorial thing, and then because that's the last expression in the file, in the function, that's the output of the function as well. Have we lost anyone yet? Questions? Cool. Alright. Now for some cool stuff. So first, the structs. If you remember before, you make a struct by let foo equals capital foo squiggles and then your fields. Similarly, you can do the same thing but backwards. Let capital foo and then your fields equal lowercase foo. And it'll take the fields, pull them out, assign them to variables for you. So here, you've got the name of the field, and then a colon, and then the name of the variable you want to create. You can also just do this, which is shorthand for that. So, some JavaScript people might have seen this. You can destructure objects. So can we. Um, <laughs> I'm not 
obsessed with trying to make you guys like Rust or anything, I promise. <laughs> no bias, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's destructuring. For the tuple structs, so equals food, capital foo true seven. Here, let foo true number equal the other thing. So after this line, number would be declared with a value equal to seven. Variable goes in, variable comes out the same way. Then the enums. So I said before, it's a mystery what you're going to get out of it. It might have one number, or it might have a foo field and a bar field, or it might be empty. So you can't just say let and then destructure it. But we've got the sneaky if let. All right. And so it will check. This is what we call a pattern. These are all patterns. Take the pattern, and it says, does this pattern match the variable? If it does, it will take the bindings out of that pattern, so the variables in that length bar. And then inside of this if expression, you'll be able to use it. All right. Similarly, for the other enum variant with more complex stuff, it's meant to be symmetrical. The way you create it is the way you destruct it. And then in the case where you want to check multiple different, hello, can people see this over the screens? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, in the case where you want to check multiple different cases, we've got match. Match is like a Rust switch statement, except one, it's an expression, because everything's an expression. And two, you can put patterns in there, rather than just constants. So we've got an enum. It's a mystery, we don't know what it is. This will say, if it matches this pattern, then the x is var plus one. If it matches this pattern, then the x is var. If it matches this pattern, then the x is seven. And that will evaluate to an expression, which you can do whatever you want with. Right. Um, with that, all of the right-hand sides are expressions. Yes? How big is the, the type member? Um, so how big is the tag that attaches? Chances are it'll be one byte or more depending on alignment and whatever LLVM thinks is the best decision. Yeah? Um, with option, isn't it nothing specifically? Um, the option you know? Yeah. That's getting a bit ahead of things. But like it, it doesn't have, it doesn't tag at all. all. Oh, um, the option for those who haven't seen it, <laughs> That's option. Spoiler, we have generics. Generics look like this. Those are not <laughs> characters. Um, so, option is an enum with a value or no value. The compiler will make optimizations if there's a pointer that can't be null and remove the type heading, but. Yeah, that's a little bit off topic, come talk to me later. <laughs> so yeah, that's match. There's the block expression with squiggle braces around it, and you can do whatever you want in here. And that all evaluates one expression, it's all fine. All right, will, good questions? Okay. Um, next up, methods, functions, but for objects. So we break methods and, and structs up a little bit. In something like Java, you'd say class this, and then you'd list the variables, the yeah, variables, and then you'd list the methods. Here we separate it, so you've got the struct definition, where you list the actual fields of it, or you could have an enum definition there where you list the possible variants of the enum. And then we separate the methods out into what's called an impl or implementation block. So impl foo. So this is defining a bunch of methods for the foo type. Um, I'll start here. So for those who are familiar with Python, always needing to take a this argument for things. Rust similar, but with self. The reason for that is what would be a static method in other languages. For us, it's just a method that doesn't have a self-argument. There's a lot of things like static methods and constructors 
that we don't treat differently. They're all just methods to us. It's just some methods take a self argument and some methods don't. All right. Um, so this new function is what you would call a constructor. Right? It doesn't take any, uh, there's no and self in here, which means that it doesn't, it's a static method, so to speak, so you don't need an instance of the object to call it. Um, the name new is just a convention. There's no forcing for you to do that. And then the return type of the method is self. Self with a capital S just evaluates to whatever you're implementing for. So this is a function that takes no arguments and returns a foo object. So it's a constructor, but we don't call it a constructor because we don't believe a constructor is getting special treatment. Um, it seems like a weird thing to be not wanting to happen. But because constructors aren't special, you can put constructors in an interface, for example. I'll come back to that. Um, so yeah, methods, they look like this. Documentation comments, so you can normally just put a regular comment, or if you put an extra slash, it becomes a documentation comment. And then more docs. This is Rust's equivalent of Java doc, or um, Doxygen, or doc strings, or whatever you have. So we have a nice tool which will read your code, take these comments, build a web page, let you search stuff, all that jazz. So this is methods. Once you get past the and self as a first argument, everything else just follows your regular syntax for the functions. Um, there is more Rust syntax to the Rust language. What I've crashed through recently should be enough to understand the rest of the stuff that I go over. But if you want to learn more, please learn more. <laughs> <laughs> there is a Rust programming language book. Um, there's, if you Google that, it'll come up. Anyway, so any questions on Rust syntax before we, yeah. What's the ampersand for? What's the ampersand for? <laughs> the ampersand is for a reference. So that says, um, where's a good example? If we see it for a normal variable, this is saying rather than this variable is an integer, it's a reference to an integer. Um, in the particular self case, it's shorthand for self. Being like that. I'll touch on references soon. I do have a plan to explain all of the Rust referencing stuff. Um, so yeah, that's syntax. Anyone else? No more heckling? <laughs> 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 all right, the good bits. So this is where I famously try to persuade you all that Rust is the one true programming language you should all be learning. Um, disclaimer, Rust is not the one true programming language. <laughs> it's a tool, it has its uses. I happen to think it has a lot of uses because it's really good. But it is just a tool. You can write code in other programs and it can still potentially work. <laughs> um, <laughs> take this all with a pinch of salt. Rust is cool, but you don't have to use it. So, the good bits part one, cargo. Cargo is our package manager, it's like npm or gradle or the maven command line tool or stack or what's cabal I think it is. It's like all of those except it works and <laughs> it's standardized. So there is no find the project, go to the readme, follow, accidentally summon a demon and following the weird arcane steps on how to compile the project. <laughs> realize you're on this different operating system to the person who wrote the project, so you're doomed to fail. <laughs> There's none of that mess. You clone the repo, or you go to the thing, and you just type cargo build, and it builds it. Or you type cargo run, and it runs it. 
or you type cargo doc and it opens the nice web page full of documentation for the library. All of it just works. You type cargo format, it will run the auto formatting script so that it all looks the same. You type cargo test, it will run all your unit tests. Everything just happens. Um, it just works, so by default, you don't need to configure anything aside from listing your dependencies. Um, if you do want to configure things, it's in Toml, which is a really great formatting language that I would strongly recommend independently Googling because I don't have time to talk about it now. Um, yeah, the idea is the defaults should work for you. If the defaults don't work for you, changing them is really easy. And that's a really nice thing to have. So, as well as standardizing the way that you build your code, no weird make files or CMake lists, it's just cargo build and the documentation. The other thing it does is it's package manager. So, there is a website. This is our npmjs.org for those people. And there's just libraries. I can say, give me the regex library. And here is the regex library. Or I can say, give me the OpenGL library. And it'll give me a bunch of OpenGL libraries. Um, all of these, there's nice little links to the documentation for all of them so you can have a look around. But in, is that hard enough? So in every project, you have the Toml file. Right? This is everything I need to build my project. My project is 500 lines of code and then another what, nine external libraries being pulled in, all of those pulling in their own libraries. I think it, and this sounds somewhat scary, but I promise it's good. It totals up to about 190 libraries when you follow all the dependencies. And because we all just use the same build tool and the same package repository, I type cargo build and it builds all of them the exact same way in the output box. And everyone's happy. All I need to do is list the libraries and the versions that I want, and then it just does the rest for me. Everything's, everything's good. Um, and on crates.io, I think we've got up here, there are 24, 25,000 libraries available. I'm not going to sit here and tell you there's a library for everything. There isn't. But there are libraries for a lot of things. Is there a library for GUI? There's about six and they all suck. <laughs> but I don't know of languages where that is. So. Um, but there are libraries for a lot of things. And what I have found my own personal biased experience is that the libraries are generally of a pretty high quality. Um, or if the libraries aren't of high quality, there'll be other libraries that do the same thing that are pretty good. So, that's Cargo. Cargo's cool. Just as proof, Cargo doc. This, uh, uh, I was wrong about my estimate of how many libraries. I'm going to leave this and come back to it. <laughs> but this takes my crate, all crate is my right, all of its dependencies, all of their dependencies, everything, generates the documentation for all of them, makes all the links match up for the exported types, pops it open in a web browser. Um, <laughs> 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 um, so it just works. <laughs> um, seriously though, when you have compiling code, target with a godsend, and it's one of my favorite things about Rust. So, next up, error handling. We don't have exceptions, we don't have if and not equal nil. Um, we have monads, I guess, for the Haskellers among you. For the rest of you, we have enums and enums. Yeah. So the idea is, 
everything that could return an error, the return type is potentially an error. So you've got this enum, so it's either got an OK value or an error value, so that's the type of your output or the type of your error. And the idea is, if you've got thingo, which is the result of a computation which may have failed, instead of returning the value and throwing an exception, which you have to catch later, it returns a result object, right? And if you want to use the value that came out of that function, you need to inspect the result object. There's no way to get the result, get the answer without dealing with the possibility of the error. It forces you to be explicit in it, it forces you to be diligent, and if you forget an error, your code won't compile, which means that by the time your code does compile, you've looked at all the errors, or most of the errors, hopefully. I can't promise if your code compiles that it will work, but it's certainly, I spend a lot more time getting things to compile than I do debugging, which is nice because compilers give you error messages in human rather than in SQL. <laughs> <laughs> so inspecting the result. So thingo is the result of a function which may or may not have failed. We use a match, an expression. If it's okay, then we have a good value. If it's an error, we can print out the error. We can return an error value up to the parent function. All right. You could alternatively do other things there. If you want to use a default value, abort, various other things. But the most common thing that people ended up doing when Rust was created and people started writing code was everyone was looking at the error and passing it up to the parent function and then dealing with it at the top level with a well abort because the import was wrong. I mean, obviously you want the opportunity to do good error handling, but this is the majority case. Right? You don't want to handle every single error as it comes up. A lot of the time you just want to gather them all up for the parent. And so after some debates on forums, we now have a shorthand for that. Yeah? So what's the difference there that that one needs return? This one needs return. Versus the other ones. Yeah, so with the other functions I didn't have the return keyword because it was just the last expression in the function is the output of the function. Return is a keyword which is a statement or an expression which doesn't, which evaluates to an empty type. Um, it lets you return nothing, basically. I could cram the entire rest of my function into a block here, and then I wouldn't need return because there's just two branches and they both evaluate to a value. But the return keyword lets me restructure things a little bit and, yeah, break out value for the error cases. So that's a pattern that people found was being used a lot. And so we have a shorthand for it. You chuck a question mark at the end, and it'll pass the error up or give you the OK value. Um, so it's always explicit. You can't forget to do it. But also, you don't have to give yourself repetitive strain injuries typing out the same bit of error handling code every time you call a function. <laughs> I'm not naming any languages here. Um, <laughs> and then the other thing is errors don't get any special treatment. They are not magical exceptions that do weird magical things. They're just values. You can return them. You can call them. You can create them. It's just. There's nothing special about them. They're just really special and useful. Yeah? Is there a name for the question mark syntax at the end? Because like Swift is called optional chaining in Rust. I've never seen anyone name it. It's just the question mark. I don't know. The only bit of name in Rust syntax I've seen right. is the um, turbo fish. Turbo fish. <laughs> which looks like that. Because sometimes generics get weird. <laughs> But I've just wanted to make you like Rust so I'm going to However, we can get all of the magic exception stuff like backtraces and other things. I don't know how or what black magic people use, but there are ways with assembly that you can print out a backtrace as you go, even though it's just a regular value. And while it is black magic and horrifying, there are libraries that just do it. <laughs> friendly and easy. And so I just use those. Um, so with some error handling, 
now would be a good time to show you my code. Well, good relative, if not good code, but. So this is the search engine that I built. Um, so you can see here my function, the build index function. It returns a result. Um, that's those brackets are just the void type. Error is a struct, which is an error. And then I create a directory. Creating a directory is an IO operation. It might fail. I chuck a question mark at the end, and it's all good. In the more complicated cases, so one of the things we do with a project is when you're building an index, you just recursively walk through the entire project. So every time you access a file, there's a potential for an I.O. error. But if you get one I.O. error, you don't want to crash the entire indexing. So we've got this file, which may or may not be an error. OK, syntax happening doesn't work. Um, so we match on the file. And if it's OK, then we return the file. If it's an error, we log a message, and then we return no. Yeah. Where's that macro from? This macro, the worn one. Yeah, so um, things I forgot from the Rust syntax thing. Rust has macros. Anything with an exclamation mark at the end of it is a macro rather than a function. Um, they're macros so that we can do nice things like string interpolation, which these braces say take the first argument turn it to a string, put it in here. Kind of like Python, I think, has this now. But this macro is a warn macro. It says check the log level. If the log level is warn, info, debug, or trace, then print it, otherwise skip it. There's a create called log. Okay. Has all of those in it. So yeah, that's error handling. I have the easy option of I don't want to deal with it, just pass it up to the parent, or the other option of handle it manually, log the error, move aside, or whatever other actions you want to take here. So yeah, that's error handling. It's nice because you don't get unexpected null pointer exceptions. Yeah, error handling. Next up, the Rust runtime. There isn't one, that's a lie. Everything has a runtime. C has all the runtime, assembly has a runtime, that's what the operating system is there for. Um, however, this is cool. you guys on the back that are frowning can back me later. <laughs> <laughs> there are exceptions to every rule. There isn't a Rust runtime. What I mean by this is that a Rust binary is pretty much as far as the operating system is concerned, it has as much dependencies as a statically, statically linked C binary. You can compile it on one machine, run it on another machine, as long as they're binary compatible. You don't have to install libraries. You don't have to install a runtime environment. It just, it's a binary, you run it. It has a main function. We've also got low memory usage. Rust doesn't have a garbage collector, doesn't have any fancy JIT stuff going on, it's just a flat binary that runs, which means low memory usage, small binaries, drag and drop executables, easy to deploy, um, and it's also pretty quick. It's not going to waste CPU. If your Rust program's trying to get 100% CPU, it's because it's busy. It's not because it's chasing down pointers or anything. Blazingly fast, that, I mean, it's pretty quick. <laughs> we used to have the phrase blazingly fast on the front page of the website. It's a little bit of a joke at this point, but <laughs> it is really quick. There are plenty of cases of various companies or developers having a tool, thinking this tool's too slow, rewriting the Rust, suddenly it's 50% faster, two times faster, five times faster, 20 times faster, depending on what you're coming from. Of course, there's a caveat there that if you use a bad algorithm, your code will be slow, and if you use a better algorithm, your code will hopefully be faster. Using a language won't make your code fast, but using Rust as your language isn't going to make your code slow. 
any, any heckling about? <laughs> <laughs> you have to suffer now. <laughs> the other thing, because you're not porting an entire language runtime, it's relatively easy to cross compile. Nothing is actually easy to cross compile in my experience. <laughs> There's always going to be that one pick that no one likes. But there are definitely harder things to port than Rust. Would be what's out there. I have in the past got Rust running on a Raspberry Pi after compiling it on an x86 machine that I didn't control. So it's doable. And again, you just pass dash dash target equals arm into a cargo build command. And it just happens. So the runtime's nice. Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> More Rust the good bits, procedural macros. So this is a little bit freaky, but also really, really, really cool. Um, so a macro in most languages is sort of a pattern matching thing. You say if you see this pattern plug in this pattern, if you see this pattern, plug in that pattern. And we have pattern matching based macros in Rust, and they're cool. And you can do a lot with them, but sometimes they're not quite enough for all of the compile time expression that you want. And so we have procedural macros, which the procedural macro is halfway between a macro and a compiler plugin. So you, your library, the macro, is a function that gets compiled and run, and it takes essentially a string of Rust code, and it spits out a new string of Rust code. And in the middle, anything can happen. For example, you could, you have your struct, and you put a little macro above it. This is an attribute macro. Syntax isn't important, that's a macro. This is a key takeaway here. And so it takes the struct definition, and it will spit out a bunch of code, which is the original struct definition, and then also the full implementation of a JSON parser for that struct. Strongly typed, no reflection, pretty quick, everyone's happy. And so without writing any extra code, you can go from a string literal, the R hash is sort of a don't bother escaping characters inside of here. Um, we have levels of string, escape string, extra escape string, more escapes. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever want to put quotes and then three hashes in a row inside your string without escaping it, you can do that as long as you put quotes and four hashes in a row. Now. <laughs> Has its uses, like when you're writing out JSON. But then it's just pause, done has a potential for error, so there's a little question mark at the end. You don't have to write the parser yourself, you don't have to write anything yourself, and the implementation you get is probably better than one you would write yourself anyway. Other procedural macros, say you're writing a web server, and you have a route handler. So your route handler takes a name, which is a string, that returns a string. How do you turn an HTTP request into a name, though? That's a lot of boilerplate code you've got to look at the request path, you've got to take out the second component, you've got to make sure that it's a valid string, then you've got to call the function. There's all of that boilerplate that no one really wants to write. So you try the procedural macro on top. The procedural macro reads your function, reads that it wants to respond to this HTTP route, and it'll do the rest. And everything's nice. You could, if you wanted to, Make to take an integer, and so the procedural macro will generate the integer parsing code and the overflow checking code and all of that nicety for you. You could make it take some <coughs> other type. As long as that type has a from string implementation, it will just do it. Um, procedural macros are really cool. They make it really easy to do what otherwise would be a lot of boilerplate. So again, I have to show off. <laughs> Here is the main function of the search engine. So this program, it does its command line argument parsing. It does it nicely. It 
it'll do all of that for you. And it's nice, and it does all the error checking, and it does the dash dash help message, and it does the dash dash version message, and it does everything. And that's a lot of code to write yourself, and no one wants to write it. So instead, hash derive, which is macro, and deriving the struct opt macro, which says take the options or the command line arguments, turn them into a struct. Or in this case, an enum, because it's side commands. But here is my struct for the build option options. It has these two fields, which have their types. I just say the long version of it is this, the short version is, and the default value is locker, default value is <coughs> directory. All of that stuff, <coughs> it generates the command line argument parser for me, generates the help function, I'm pretty sure it generates a man page writer if I want to derive a man page for it. It's all just there in that one line of procedural macro, and it's a bunch of code that I don't have to write myself. It's really friendly. So yeah, procedural macros are cool. Um, any questions on any of that jazz? Anyone who thinks it's cool? Just see. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, next up, traits. Rust is not an object-oriented language. We do not have inheritance. We do not have well, traits are kind of like interfaces for the Java people. Um, at runtime, they're a little bit better, but aside from that, yeah. So the trait, it's like an input block, but you're not defining them for a function. You write the functions, you don't. You put a semicolon at the end. You can give default implementations if you want. And then, just more syntax, rather than input foo, you implement the trait for the type. You write a bunch of bodies in there, it's all good. And then you can use your generics with your traits. Take any f as your argument, where f is, is a foo, and you can call all of those methods on it. So, I mean, this is based just simple interface stuff. There's nothing, I mean, there are a few things traits do that interfaces won't do, but the general idea is still the same. So there's an iterator trait, which says if it implements the iterator trait, you can make a for loop over it. Um, please ignore these bits, I'll explain them soon. So I have a struct. You can iterate through the fields of that struct. It's, this is a tokenizer, so it takes a string and breaks it up into four int i equals. Um, and so you can iterate over the items in that struct. I write the next function, and then elsewhere, I can take this iterator, do some map, inspect, map again, collect it into an array. Um, yeah, it's kind of like Java streams or um, other things, but <laughs> kind of like Java streams or Haskell just being Haskell or um, Python, what's the word? Duck tech. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. <laughs> comprehensions. Yeah, Python comprehensions. It's all same general idea. We do it with traits. If you implement the trait, you get the whole world of manipulating tools available to you for free. And then also, I implemented, there's a token stream trait, which the search engine library uses. I have an item that implements token stream. I say this is a tokenizer and it uses it easily and friendly. It all just works. It's slightly nicer, nicer than passing function pointers around. Other than that, not too much special to see here. Now the borrow checker. So <laughs> this is somewhat infamous in that it is the biggest barrier to getting into Rust when you're first learning. But it is one of the good bits for a reason. The Rust borrow checker is really cool. What it does is it's, Rust doesn't have a garbage collector. 
You're never going to have to call malloc and run ever or free. It'll do it all for you. The borrow checker bridges that gap between no garbage collector and not calling free. As well as that, the borrow checker makes sure your code is thread safe and won't compile it if it isn't. That's a bold claim, and it's one that I can pretty confidently stand behind. Unless you use what's called unsafe Rust, <laughs> if, your if your code compiles, it will not have thread safety issues, or it won't have deadlocks. It might have deadlocks, but it won't have data races. It won't access out of bounds memory. It won't have any use after free bugs. It might leak memory, but it probably won't. All of that just gets handled for you by the borrow checker. And as well as that, the borrow checker gives some nice architectural advice on your code. It says this is bad, rewrite it all from scratch when you ask it to compile. Um, yeah, so how it does it is with references. So if you have some type foo and you're passing foo to a function, you could either pass foo or a reference to foo, or a mutable reference to foo, right? If you pass foo by itself, then that's, for the C++ people, that's your standard move. So if you pass a variable to a function like this, you can't use it after it's been passed into the function. What that means is that if the function frees the memory at the end, you're not going to get any use after free errors, because the compiler won't let you touch the memory anyway. References, you can look, you can't touch. You can have as many references to a variable at any given time as you want. You could have three different functions and three different threads all using the same reference to the same memory. Because with a regular reference, it's immutable, you can't modify the value, which means that there's no, there's no issues with accessing it concurrently in multiple threads. Everyone's reading, no one's writing, you're all happy. Then there is and mute, which is an immutable reference. Only one person can have a mutable reference at a time, and you can't have a mutable reference and a bunch of regular references coexisting. Basically, if you look at the definition of a data race, two threads are trying to write at the same time, or one thread writing and the other thread reading at the same time, you build up the rules to stop that, and then the compiler enforces them with these references. All right? So if you want to add things to a list, you need a mutable reference to that list. If you've been given a mutable reference to the list by some function or some variable, the compiler will make sure that you are the only person who has a reference to that list that's active at that point in time. And if it can't make sure of that, i.e. if there's a chance that someone else is using the list, your code doesn't compile. All right? Yeah? Um, is the middle one, the uh, constant reference, is that transitive? Uh, yes. So, yeah. Um, you can turn a reference into another reference. You can turn either of them into a constant reference or the mutable reference into another mutable reference. Um, and the way we do that is with lifetimes, which is the other half of the borrow checker that scares people. <laughs> so a lifetime is like a generic type, but with an apostrophe at the start. And it's essentially the compiler has a mapping from lifetimes to when the reference drops and when you're no longer going to use that reference anymore. So you could say this isn't just a reference to self, it's a reference to self that will drop at the end of lifetime A. Right? And then you can say ensure that lifetime A is at least as long as lifetime B. And then you can return something with a reference to data with lifetime B. Right. So the output of the function has lifetime B. The input of the function has lifetime A. So at the end of lifetime A, for all we know, self is going to get free. At the end of lifetime B, no one's allowed to use this memory anymore. We make sure that lifetime A is at least as long as lifetime B, if not longer. That way, by the time self gets dropped at the end of lifetime A, lifetime B has already ended. No one's going to use these bytes anymore. No one's going to get any use after free errors. Was that a hand? Okay. 
Yeah. If it has to live as long as lifetime A, why not just return the lifetime A? Um, yeah. So this is an overly verbose example. When you do transitive referencing, the compiler will create separate lifetimes for each one in case you drop them piecemeal. But normally, if you're writing this, you leave all the lifetimes out, and the compiler will guess. But it'll guess right, so you don't have to worry. In the cases where it doesn't guess is where you need to explicitly specify lifetimes. But what that means is that if you take two pointers to a function, and you return a pointer, you can say to the compiler, this is the pointer you need to watch out for. Like this is which of the inputs you need to not free before you free this one. And so you can do some clever stuff there. The other half of that is as well as making sure when keeping track of when you free things, the lifetimes keep track of when you're allowed to create a new type of reference to it. So if you have a mutable reference and an immutable reference, you need to make sure that the lifetime of one ends before the other lifetime starts, so that they don't overlap. Right. It's a lot of type theory, and the people making this did have to do a decent amount of bleeding edge research to come up with it. For the most part, the borrow check represents itself to a programmer as just a little thing in the back of your mind that tells you that you're all safe and your code's working, and occasionally it'll tell you that you have a thread safety bug before the user's telling you six months down the road. Um, other good bits, no undefined behavior. Rust code sec can sec fault if you um, have a stack overflow or other things, but it will always sec fault deterministically. There's never any memory corruption. It's all defined, good FFI, community's great, running short on time. <laughs> the other last little bit that I want to talk about was Rust in the wild. So there are people in real life that use Rust. Has anyone heard of Rick Brown? Okay, that's fewer hands than I expected. It's a really cool search tool. Um, it's used inside of VS Code. Firefox, have people heard of Firefox? <laughs> <laughs> um, Firefox rewrote their CSS rendering engine, or decent chunks of their CSS engine in Rust, so that they could multi-thread it. It was previously C++. C++ does support multi-threading. Firefox, Mozilla and Google have put all their weight before into using C++ to multi-thread this program, this problem of rendering CSS, and it has not worked for anyone, no matter how hard they try. And then they did it in Rust, and the compiler told them about their thread safety bugs, and it's shipped and working, installed on people's computers. Dropbox uses Rust. They had slow code, now they have fast code. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cloudflare, same deal. And then Linkerd, that's another thing to talk to me about it if you're interested. And then there's Micro. Micro is my thesis slash the project that I'm working on is Genic. That's written in Rust. I am getting paid to write it. And Genic is hiring. <laughs> Please talk to me afterwards. So yeah, Rust does get used in the wild. And a lot of Rust programs do ship to lots of users. And they work still. <laughs> um, that's me well out of time. Does anyone have any questions? Um, do you, before you said install object, um, or you said 